go ahead and get going so that we don't go too far over today. So we should uh, pray. <laughs> Father God, um, we just we, we thank you for bringing us here this morning. We know that you have drawn each one of us, every single one of us. You've drawn us here for something specific, for something that you want to speak with about what's going on in our lives. Lord, you want to speak with us, and you want to teach us, and just be revealed to us. And so we dedicate this time to that, to you, just to be ready for what it is you want to do in each one of our hearts this morning. Um, this is a time of work for you. We call it a service because, uh, Lord, it is a ministering of your word, and your word does that incredible work in our lives. So we surrender ourselves, Lord, to what it is you want to do this morning. We just ask, Lord, that you would bless this time, bless the word as it goes forth, and we, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, if you want to turn to Titus, we are still in chapter (laughs) 1. It'll speed up a little bit after this, I promise. Um, But as we've said, I think this is our third week in this book now. Uh, We are continuing through what truly is it is a manual for being a godly church in an ungodly world. And so far in that, we've, we've gone over some very important definitions in understanding that. Definitions that we need to know. As believers in Jesus Christ and as students of the Word of God, we throw these words around and we go through all of life thinking, well, we just know what the word means because we think we know what it means. And and what we've been talking about in this is we need to understand these definitions as we go through. Definitions that we're going to repeat several more times as we go through this book. But we've talked about at great length now, we've talked about this word doctrine, right? Doctrine, very simply, it is a set of beliefs. And truly a governing set of beliefs. It is the methodology and the ideology upon, one which, upon which one builds a life. And the methodology and the ideology, you know, which is upon which one builds a faith. Or upon which one builds a community or a business or a political organization or even a nation. In methodology, it is the system of methods to live by that set of beliefs. It's the system of methods to live by that set of beliefs. In ideology, it is the system of ideas and the system of ideals that defines the set of beliefs. These two things, they make up a doctrine, methodology and ideology of the set of beliefs. So biblical doctrine then, when we talk about biblical doctrine, it is a set of beliefs that is anchored in Scripture, a set of beliefs that is anchored only in Scripture, Sound biblical doctrine. And we keep seeing this word sound, and we're going to continue to see this word sound as we go through this book. It is the word in the original Greek when we see it. It is the word hugiano. It is to have, literally by definition, it is to have sound health, or to be well in the body, to be incorrupt, to be whole. Literally, when we read that word sound doctrine, it is to have healthy doctrine. Okay? Understand that. Sound doctrine, healthy doctrine, biblical doctrine, it starts with the basic acceptance that God is truly God, not just in word, but in our lives. He is God, and that there is no other God, that there is no other God to us in the way that we speak. There's no other God to us in the way that we live and practice our lives. God is truly God. And hand in hand with that, God's word is an errant. God's word is incapable of being wrong. That is what that word inerrant means. It's incapable of being wrong. Those are the definitions as we go through. Scripture was given to us as a whole. It was given to us as a working whole. Every piece agreeing and working with the next piece. It was given to be implemented and applied as a whole. You can't just cherry pick scripture and form your own doctrine from it. You take the whole of scripture and let the whole of scripture define your doctrine. That's what we're seeing through this book. Scripture was not given to be molded into socially acceptable pieces or politically conformable pieces. It was given as a whole. Scripture was given as a whole to reveal a perfect savior and a perfect redeemer and a perfect deliverer to this world. To reveal one who is able to mold us into his image. That is why we have received scripture. Romans 8.29, it says, For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be firstborn among many brethren. That speaks, of course, of our Lord. That speaks of Jesus. And we talk about this idea of being conformed into his image. That word conformed in the Greek, it is sumorphos. 
Literally, it is a continual fashioning like unto. It is a continual fashioning of who you are into his image by his hand. So when, understand, don't get frustrated when you find out in life you aren't where you thought you were. When you find out that you're not as far along as you thought you were, he is continually conforming you into his image. That means you're not there yet. And you're not going to be there yet. He will continue to do that work. Jesus has started to work in your life. And he will be faithful, Scripture tells us, he will be faithful to complete that work in your life. So don't lose heart when you realize you're not as far along as you thought you were. It is a continual work, a continual shaping, a continual conforming into his image. But in all of that, the foundation of that work, when we talk about the work Jesus is doing in your life, the foundation of that work, it must be the word of God. Always. But more than that, the word of God, it also must be the structure, the framework of that work. It's the framework that makes the building stand, his word. That also must be the word of God, the foundation and the structure. And the word of God in that it also must be the lifeblood, the very breath of the organism. And in that, understand, we read that Jesus is the word of God. That's how we can say it's our breath. That's how we can say that it's the lifeblood of who we are because the word of God is Jesus. And the word of God points to Jesus and the word of God speaks of Jesus. We saw last week in all this, Colossians chapter 1, verse 18, it tells us Jesus is the head of the body. It's going to be tremendously important as we go through this book. As we move through, it's going to, we're going to keep tracking back to that central idea. Jesus is the head of the body. Jesus is the head of the body. Jesus is the head of the body. When that piece is in order, when that one piece is in order, things work. They just do. <laughs> But when that piece falls out of order, when he ceases to be the head, when anything else takes the lead, when anything else becomes the head, we will have structural, integral, foundational, substantial problems in what we try to do here. He must be the head. So in all of this, just contextually speaking, you had Paul, who had left Titus on the island of Crete. And he left him there specifically to set the churches there in order, to set Jesus as the head in each of those churches. And he sent Titus this letter after he had left him there. He sent this letter to help in that process. Here's how you set a church in order. Here's what a church should look like. And last week, it went into appointing elders in every city. Appoint elders over every city. That's what had been written to Timothy. And he was to look for specific qualities. And we went over those last week. He was to look for a man who was blameless. He was to look for a man who was a husband of one wife. One who has faithful children. He was to look for a steward of God, literally one who feeds God's people from God's word. That's what that word steward tracks down to, one who feeds God's people from God's word. Not self-willed and not quick-tempered, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money. Such a man is supposed to be hospitable, we read, a lover of what is good, sober-minded, a safe place to come and talk to, (laughs) just holy, self-controlled, holding fast the faithful word as he has been taught. That's what Timothy was to look for. One able to, by sound doctrine, we read this last week, by sound doctrine, by healthy doctrine, not by pet doctrine, not by personal pet peeve, but by the whole of the word that God has given us. By doctrine of the whole of scripture, one who is able to exhort and one who was able to convict those who contradict. We went through that whole list last week. I mean, it was a lot last week, right? We went through that whole list, and we talked about this. Not a single one of those quantities, not a single one speaks to skill of the person. Not a single one of those speaks to the knowledge or the talent or the education. It doesn't pertain to the merit of the individual, nothing that we saw. Each one of the things that we considered last week, it was simply a marker, a marker of the character of the person. Each one answers the question, does Jesus have the whole of who you are? That's how you know by looking at these markers in a life. You cannot even hope to rightly steward God's people in any capacity. You cannot hope to rightly steward them, whether it be a church body or a group study, or even in your home with the people that God has entrusted into your care, you cannot rightly hope to steward them, to rightly feed them in word or in deed. 
if you are not given wholly over to God. You cannot rightly hope if he only has some of who you are. And you cannot rightly hope to do this even if he has most of who you are. The question here is, does God have the whole of your life? Are you surrendered wholly over to him? And these were markers as to one who was surrendered wholly over. So that all being set now, we move into why this is all important, to why these markers were being established. Moving on into verse 10 of chapter 1, it says, For there are many insubordinate, both idle talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole households, teaching things which they ought not for the sake of dishonest gain. For there are many insubordinate. The word here in the Greek for insubordinate, it is the word anapotakos. It's a fun word. <laughs> it means unsubdued, not put under, specifically regarding authority. So what it's saying here is there are many not living under the authority and not living under the lordship of Jesus Christ. There are many. And that is a huge problem in the life of a professing believer. I mean, you can be well-educated. You can be full of knowledge. You can be well-reasoned. You can be well-intentioned. You can be good-natured. But if Jesus' lordship is not in its proper place in your life, nothing else will be in order in your life. Understand that. You can have a lot of things going for you. If Jesus is not the head over your life, it's not going to be in order. And we read here, there are many not put under. Many not under Jesus' authority in the church, which makes them, what we're reading here, it makes them not of the church. Those who are not under Jesus' lordship, they are not of the church. They might be here. They might show up regularly, but they do not live in agreement that Jesus is Lord. They don't live that truth. They may speak it, but they don't live it. It says idle talkers and deceivers. This word idle talker, it is the word metilagos. It is a senseless or a mischievous talker. <laughs> it's a compound word, the word matios, which means empty, profitless, idolatrous. And they combine that word matios with legos, which literally means words. <laughs> so empty words, profitless words, idolatrous words, matilogos. So there are many who are not surrendered to the lordship of Jesus Christ in their lives. Many who speak empty words, in idolatrous words, profitless words, and that accounts for any word, an empty word. It accounts for any word that is not rooted here in God's word. And this is the polar opposite of what we saw as we went through last week. Titus was to search out men who had fully surrendered their lives to Jesus and who speak only from the authority of God's word. This is who he was to be on the watch for. They would hold fast to the word we were told. And now we see there are many who are the polar opposite of that. As he's making the search, he would come across many who weren't just in agreement with it, they were on the opposite side of it. Those living as best as they see fit in their own eyes. Those who speak empty words. And those whose words might sound good. They might sound good. They might tickle the ears, but there is no substance in those words. No foundation there. Paul would write some years from this, just a few short years from this, maybe even months. He would write specifically in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 3 and 4, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. And there's that word sound again. They will not endure healthy doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. And the warning here in Titus is very similar to what he gives in 2 Timothy. Establish teachers who will distribute the law of the Lord. Make that your focus as you go forward. Establish teachers who will hold fast the faithful word. Because there are many, there are many who will not give proper place to Jesus' lordship in the church. And there are far too many who will be content to speak empty words. Far too many. And there will be far too many more who have itching ears who are perfectly content to listen to those empty words as they're spoken. And it says here, especially those of the circumcision. So on Crete, remember, we're talking about a litter delivered into the middle of this island in the middle of the Mediterranean. On Crete, there was really a various mix of beliefs 
among the people there. You had worship of Roman gods prevalent there. Greek philosophy just kind of ruled the thinking of the land. We, we go by the philosopher's logic. There was local mythology that people bought into. And you also had a fairly substantial Jewish population, people who had traveled there, migrated there, fled there. Those who held to legalism, those who held to the tradition of the law, those literally of the circumcision. Truly, what's being said here, those who would try to add any piece of the law or any piece of legalism to your salvation, watch for those is what Paul is saying here. Because what's true is that the entirety of the gospel rests on Jesus' perfect work on the cross. The entirety of the gospel, our entire salvation, rests on his work that he has already completed, that he has already finished. He has already fulfilled the law and the prophets. And there were those there in Crete who kept trying to resurrect it and bring it back and bring it into the church. Salvation is simply giving your life over into Jesus' hands giving your life into his love and placing your life under his authority, placing your life under his lordship. But the common lifestyle in Crete, it cut directly against that. The common lifestyle in Crete was one of excess, absolutely across the board. You had all of these backgrounds. Picture Titus's plight in this. You had all these backgrounds, all these upbringings coming under one umbrella as they heard the miraculous saving message of this gospel all of these upbringings coming into one umbrella, and there were those who tried to bring in what they had been brought up in, in with them, into these fellowships. They tried to implement the law, tried to bring in the philosophy of the world and the teachings of the world, and they tried to do so by adding to Jesus' work. They were trying to add to God's word, do these things and you will be saved. Uphold these rituals and you will be saved. And then in all that, there were also those who were attempting to bring peace and unity in these new fellowships as they tried to sort all these things out. They tried to do so, though, by taking away from God's word, by chipping away at the purity that God's word presents. They were making concessions and compromises with the culture and with the various backgrounds and the various belief systems that were coming under the umbrella of this church. And that wasn't right either. Neither side was right. You can't add to and you cannot take away from God's word. They were adding sin to the church. They were welcoming sin in the church. And when you do that, when you add sin, when you welcome sin, when you become comfortable around sin, it will never bring true peace anytime, anywhere. Because sin at its root, is, it is destructive. And that's what it does. So to truly minister in that place, in Crete, to truly steward You had to declare God's word as absolute truth. And you had to do that in a place where everyone had always kind of believed whatever they wanted. Everyone lived their own truth. (laughs) You had to take a clear and a bold and a strong stand for the word of God amidst all these competing factors. And you had to do so without compromise and also without adding anything to what God had spoken. This is very relatable in the culture that we live in today, isn't it? We live in a culture that is given over to excess, a culture that is defined by self-determination and by self-will, and where the common drive in our culture, the common refrain in our culture, it is relativity. You live your truth. You speak your truth. That's the culture we live in. And you see so much of that that has crept into the church over the years, where truth is often compromisable now. And truth becomes negotiable now, where everyone is encouraged to live their own truth and love their own love and find their own way to God. And you see it in the church. Work your own way to God. Find your, you know, choose your own adventure. (laughs) And the problem with that, the whole problem in that is that always, you live by that type of thinking in any situation, always eventually it gives way to what I think is best for me and mine and what I think is best for the world. And do what is right in your own eyes. I will do what best suits my interests. I will do what make, m- makes most sense to me, what's most comfortable for me. And in that, it happens so subtly, in that you yourself become Lord in your life. It's a lordship problem. What happens there is that healthy and sound doctrine is replaced with the doctrine of self. Self-examination and self-improvement, self satisfaction 
aspiring to the set of morals exemplified in the man, Jesus Christ, aspiring to who he was, but doing so through your own self-will. Tremendous danger there when you try to uphold his life on your own strength, because you can't. You can't. What we need to do is accept that Jesus Christ alone is the one who conforms us into his image, and he will give us the power to do so, and he alone has the power to do so. Recognizing him rightfully as Jesus, as the divine Son of God, the only one truly worthy of our worship and our time and our adoration. And it denies him, when we don't do that, it denies him of his true nature. When we don't recognize who he truly is, when we don't live by who he truly is, we, do, we deny ourselves of the power to change our hearts when we remove his power and his divinity from the equation. He alone can conform us to his image, and he will. But it's a continual giving over of your life into his hands. A doctrine of self, a lordship of self, it glosses over our own fallen nature. It works on the premise that we'd have half a clue of what to do on our own, and we don't. It glosses over our depravity. It glosses over our own inability to redeem ourselves, and it assumes a doctrine of self, and it assumes deep down that there is good inside each soul instead of recognizing the scriptural sound truth found in Romans chapter 3, verse 10, which says, there is none righteous, no, not one. And that's true. That's true. The truth, though, is that our God is good. And he has given his grace to us. He has given us his word. And as we said, that word is inerrant. It's incapable of being wrong. And his word is absolute. And a rebellious soul, one who is given over to any lordship other than Jesus Christ, a rebellious soul doesn't like absolutism. They hate it. They reject it. I don't like absolutism because I think I know what's best for me. And it says of these here in verse 11, these whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole households, teaching things which they ought not for the sake of dishonest gain. And this word subvert here in, in the Greek, it is the word anatrapo. It is to overturn or overthrow. Again, this is not just speaking of the general population in Crete. This was among the church in what Titus is considering here. This was among the church in Crete. These overthrow households. And these teach things which they ought not for the sake of dishonest gain. And you see that. You see that commonly. There is always somebody who claims to have the inside track on God. Always somebody who's had a special revelation from God. Somebody who has special insight on God. Somebody who's figured it all out, and they'll tell you all about it. That fail-safe plan. But you got to buy their book, right? There's always going to be, always, every season of the church, there will always be that blockbuster book. I've got it all figured out, whereas everybody who came before me didn't. <laughs> That fad, you see it happen, that fad, it absolutely overwhelms the church when these things come out, different seasons. And in that, understand, there are good books, okay? There are good books out there. There are educational books. There are true and tremendous study helps out there. I'm not putting any of those down, and I'm not saying don't go buy books. Don't, I mean, buy books. Books are good. But what's true, what is absolutely true is there is no book that is greater than this book. And there never will be. And nobody's going to come out with one that's better. There is no book that's greater than this book. And more than that, there is no teacher that is greater than the Holy Spirit. There is nothing that I can teach you here that will be unique. I hope you understand that. There is nothing that I can teach you that God hasn't put on the tongue of at least a thousand other people, a hundred thousand other people over the two thousand years that the church has been in existence. There is no greater teacher than the Holy Spirit. When we allow him to teach, we are taught well. We are taught well. <laughs> we talked about this on Wednesday night. Even in the subtlest ways, our culture, even our church culture, we tend to set men up as intermediaries between us and God. You know, they might not wear the priestly garments. They might not have the funny hats and the robes and all that. But we set men and women up as being the buffer between us and God, the great interpreter between us and God. When God has already eternally provided that mediator for us in the perfect person of his son, Jesus Christ. But we do this. We try to set people up in that gap. And we try to live with people in that gap. And there are people who will sell you all their books and all their teachings and all their methods. And there is great financial gain 
into them in that. But if in any way the focus is pulled away from Jesus, if in any way at all, that when that happens, there's an immediate problem there. An immediate problem if the focus is not wholly and solely on Jesus Christ. One of the things, we put together the daily reading plan. I hope you're having fun with it. But one of the things is we put that daily reading plan together. Justin had brought this up, and I respect it. it was some, I'm never going to lose this the rest of my life. He brought up, we don't want a system where it led to a devotional on the front end where it led to man's word about God and then gave you God's word. We don't want that. (laughs) The purpose in this, the purpose in taking on a plan like that is that God's word would speak to you. That you would open up his word every single morning and say, Lord, what do you want to say to me today? That's the purpose. A simple nugget for you, if, if you're ever putting together a Bible study, if you're ever studying the Bible on your own at home, don't start with the commentary. Don't start with Google. Open up God's Word and read it. Read the section of Scripture and then read it again and then read it again and then read it again. And each time you read it, simply ask, God, what are you saying to me here? What do you want to say here? Because he'll say the right thing. (laughs) Chuck Smith's practice was to read a section 25 to 35 times before he taught it. You know, (laughs) And it's not like on time number 25, trumpets sound and bells ring and an angel descends from heaven and says, you have now reached super anointing. You know, it doesn't work that way. (laughs) What it is, it's just repeated exposure to God's word. Repeated exposure to what it is that he wants to say leading up to that teaching. It is repeatedly asking him, God, what am I missing here? What do you have for us here? Once you've been through that process, Once you've heard God's voice in whatever it is that you're reading, once you've heard that, then you can turn to the commentaries and see what you missed that God showed to somebody else. It's a lot of fun that way. But come here and be taught. Come here and be taught. But when you get home, read it again. Let him teach you again. Just see what he does with that. It is an incredible thing. Let God's word teach you the rest of the week. Read ahead. You know we're going to be in the next couple of verses the following week. Read ahead. See what he has for you in that. Don't just take my word for it. Let him teach you. See what God says to you prior to the study and throughout the week in everything that you're going through. See what he has to say to you. Because at the base of all of this, God desires a personal relationship with you. He desires an intimate relationship with you. He desires a deep relationship with you. And that's not, a, that's not going to come from listening to what I have to say. Understand that. It's going to come through hearing what he has to say through his word. His word will instruct you. His word will speak to you. His word will change you. It'll change your life. I promise you. It'll change your marriage, his word. It'll change your family. It'll change your workplace. It will change this church. It will change this community if you hold fast that faithful word. In verse 12 here, though, it says, One of them, a prophet of their own, said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. This testimony is true. And remember, (laughs) Titus has got to get up and read this in front of the people there. (laughs) This comes from a poet from Crete. His name was Epimenides of Knossos. It came about 600 years before this letter was written. He wrote that his own people were always liars, that they were evil beasts, that they were lazy gluttons. And Paul here says basically, yep, (laughs) that's absolutely true. Effectively, Titus, this is what you're walking into. Understand what you're walking into. Don't be shocked. Don't be disheartened when this proves to be exactly who they are. This is who they are. And frankly, this is who we all are outside of Jesus Christ. Understand that. But continuing in verse 13, Paul says, therefore, that being true, therefore rebuke them sharply, that they may be sound, there's that word again, that they may be healthy in their faith. Rebuke them sharply. Don't have any of it. Don't accept any of it. But more than that, correct them. Correct them. Don't be content just to send them on their way because that will not be healthy for them. Correct them. The intent here, the heart here is restoration. It is health in their faith that is being sought after. 
rebuke them sharply, not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men who turn from their truth, or who turn them from the truth, who turn from the truth. Excuse me, I can't read it all today. <laughs> but verse 15 says, To the pure, all things are pure. But to those who are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. But even their mind and conscience are defiled. It's a fascinating verse here. To the pure, all things are pure. So understand, the Lord and Master over your life, whoever that Lord and Master is, whatever that Lord and Master is, that will be the filter through which you process this world. Whoever your Lord is, that's your filter. If your Lord is Jesus Christ, all things are pure. All things are pure. And that is not at all to say, my Lord's Jesus Christ, I'm going to go do whatever I want. That's not what this means. That's not how this phrase is to be consumed. It's simply to say that you will see this world through Jesus' eyes when Jesus is your Lord. You'll be moved to compassion when you see with his eyes. You'll be moved to grace when you see with his eyes. You'll be moved to love and to holiness in response to the evil and the heartbreak that we are surrounded by on a daily, daily basis, to the pure. And in that, only in Jesus Christ can we ever be pure. To the pure, all things are pure. But if your Lord is of this world, nothing will be pure. If your Lord is yourself, your mind and your conscience, automatically your mind and your conscience will be defiled. So understand this in your life. You might hold Jesus in high regard. You might like the things that he says. You might like his teaching. You might agree with his teaching. Well, you may hold the things of God in high regard. That might be true, but everything that you see, if Jesus is not your Lord, everything you see is processed through the eyes of this world, which is evil and which is fallen by nature. Everything will be tainted by that. Truly, it's one of the most integral pieces in how we consider God's word. And we talked about this a couple of weeks ago, and we're going to go over it again. Are the events of the day being used to interpret the word of God in your life? Is the current culture being applied to the word of God in your life? Is the world your filter in how you consider the word of God? Are your current circumstances being applied to the word of God in your life? Or is the word of God being used to interpret the events of the day? Is the word of God being applied to the current culture? Is the word of God being applied to your current circumstances? Is the word of God your filter in this world? Understand how big of a difference there is in that. This. God has given us this. This unchanging, inerrant, rock-solid foundation for our lives. This is the filter of purity. This is what we consume all other things through. And if we can't do that, we are not pure. We are not consuming what is pure because it's not coming through this. When God's word is filtered through the eyes of the world, you get by nature what is defiled and what is impure and skewed and distorted. But when this world is filtered through the eyes of God's word, when this world is filtered through the eyes of Jesus, what you get is pure and unshakable and immovable. It's described as a sharp two-edged sword, one that cuts away the impurities in your life, one that cuts away all the compromise with this world, and one that provides a clear path to walk in in this fallen world. It provides a clear path to draw fallen souls to the risen king, this word. False teaching is a big deal. It's a big deal because of how quickly and how efficiently it's able to spread. You know, it's so dangerous because very often it will use God's words. It will, it will cherry pick. It will take pieces of scripture and use them. But it will come from a defiled mind. It'll come from an impure heart. It will use what is written here to serve the interests of self, false teaching will. It will, at its base, filter God's word through the eyes and through the heart of this world. It'll take a piece of what's right. And it'll move you ever so subtly away from the full volume of Scripture and hang you on that one section or that couple of sections of Scripture. And it always approaches in the same way. I mean, this is what you watch for when it comes to false teaching. Generally speaking, 
a false teaching or a false doctrine, in everything you read, in everything you hear, always ask yourself, what is at the heart here? Because a false teaching, a false doctrine, it will play on your insecurities. It'll play on your fears in life. It'll play on the idea that we're either not good enough for God, and we're not, (laughs) but it'll play on the idea that we must thus work harder to get to God because of who we are. Or it'll play on the idea that God is not big enough and that we must thus do more than wherever he falls short. Or a false teaching, false doctrine, it will play on our pride. It'll play on our flesh. It'll feed our desires instead of sowing to the Holy Spirit and feeding his presence in our lives. And that right there, that is the root of almost every single false teaching, every single false doctrine right there. It either works from our insecurity and our fear, or it works from our pride and our flesh. It sounds good. It generally sounds a lot like Scripture. It's generally coming right out of Scripture. It sounds good to the the undiscerning. And it sounds good to the unsuspecting because it uses the same words. But then it gets passed along to the next person, and then the next, and then the next. But the heart behind it is different. The heart behind it is different. A false, unhealthy doctrine, it is like yeast. It's like a corrupting agent that you cannot control. You release a corrupting agent into the greater body of believers, and it does that work of corruption every single time. Galatians chapter 5, verse 9 tells us a little leaven leavens the whole lump. All it takes is a little bit. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. All it takes is a little bit, and then all of a sudden the whole body is tainted. The whole body is corrupted with this teaching. Anytime you depart from the whole, the entirety of God's word. The entirety of God's word must be the filter. It must be the filter in your life. So purpose in your heart to get to know the entirety of God's word. Know what his word says so that you can spot when something doesn't line up. (laughs) Because there are many insubordinate, many idle talkers, many Deceivers. Verse 16 tells us here, they profess to know God, but in works they deny him, being abominable, disobedient, and disqualified for every good work. They profess to know God, but in works they deny him. And so much of what we saw when we went through the book of James, so much of it came down to faith being lived out in real life. Faith being lived, not simply spoken. And what we have here in this verse, it's the flip side of that coin from what we saw in James. It is a lack of living of the faith. You know, your words are sound, but your works deny Jesus Christ and his lordship. And if that's true in a life, understand, this is harsh, but it's true. If that's true in your life, what it says here is that you are abominable in that. You are disobedient. You are disqualified for every good work when Jesus is not your Lord, but you say he is. When you live with something else as your Lord, but claim Jesus as your Lord, you are abominable, disobedient, disqualified. Tremendous, tremendous danger simply in saying the words, proclaiming Jesus as your Lord, but never actually living him as your Lord. Scripture tells us it's abominable, disobedient. You are disqualified for every good work. And in that, some encouragement. (laughs) Lordship in a life. It's always an issue that can be solved in a moment. It can be made right in a single breath. You know, Lord Jesus, it's yours. It's yours. Take all of it. Here's my life. It can be solved right now with those words being prayed earnestly in your heart. But until that lordship is set in order, this is the truth of that life. Abominable. The word in the Greek boils down to detestable or idolatrous. Disobedient, the word is apathis, <laughs> unpersuadable. Disqualified, the word is adokimos. You are unapproved. You are rejected. By implication, the definition is without worth. Again, it's harsh. It's harsh, but it's real. Don't, play around, don't just play around with the words. Don't just say the words and then live whatever life you please. The life must be the proof of the words. See this, though. (laughs) Get this one piece right. Set Jesus as Lord over your life, and all those words go away forever. Every single one of those words goes away forever, because in Jesus Christ, what's true is that you are loved. Furthest thing from abominable, 
You are loved. You are accepted. You are approved in him. But you cannot live in the middle ground. You can't try to live in the middle ground. You can't sit on the fence or try to straddle what truly is an unbridgeable gap between you and him. You can't maintain lordship in your life most of the time for yourself and then claim his lordship when you find that you've gotten yourself in too deep. You can't live that life. Then go and reclaim control for yourself when things subside. To give him your life, truly, to give him your life, it means he gets your whole life in every moment from there on. And when that falls out of line, give it back to him. Doesn't mean you're disqualified. If it falls out of line, give it back to him. Give it back to him as soon as you realize it. Let him have the lordship that he deserves in your life. But notice in all of this, you can't quash unhealthy doctrine, false teaching. You can't beat faulty doctrine through sound reasoning. If you could, it would have been gone a long time ago. Understand that. You can't quash faulty doctrine through well-articulated arguments. You can't quash it through profound debate strategies. It's not going to go away. It never has. But in that, the church has not survived the many generations based on its own intellect. That's not what has brought the church as far as it has gone. The church has simply survived by the word of God. And it always will. It has been sustained simply by the hand of God. There's a bookend setup in all of this and what we're considering today. We saw the first part of it last week in verse 9 with Paul instructing Titus to install those who hold fast the faithful word as he has been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and convict those who contradict And we're going to start next week in the first verse of chapter 2, which says simply, but as for you, having considered all these other things that we just talked about pertaining to false doctrine, but as for you, speak the things which are proper for sound doctrine, healthy doctrine. So at the either side of all this, what's being introduced here is that the role of an overseer the base, the reason Timothy, or Titus, not Timothy, Titus is to install these, is to command to hold fast the faithful word and to speak healthy doctrine, which can only come from the faithful word. The answer in all of this, the answer to unhealthy doctrine, is healthy doctrine. That's the answer, period. This is what we strive for in this church. It's what you should strive for in your life, chasing after sound doctrine. Sound doctrine will defeat the unhealthy doctrine in your life. 